if I press this, I think we might well actually be live, Chris. We're, we're live. I think we're live. There's a red button now. It was blue. It's now red. Oh, goodness. Uh, good evening, everyone. How, how, how are you all? There's people. You're already here in the chat. Excellent. Oh, that's a good point. I need to pre I need to press the I always forget to do this. I always line up a tweet saying we are live exclamation mark. And about 50 percent of the time, I forget to press the tweet button when it actually when we actually go live. Uh, yeah, never mind. Right. So uh, pin that and then uh, say hello. So it's it. We're here. The my audio is working. Oh, my goodness. Right. Chris. Hello, Hello, Chris. Good evening. Wait a minute. I can press this. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Chris. Ah. Chris Volkoinen is here, everyone. We. It's it's going to be a good episode. I. It's a long. It, it, I don't know if it's going to be a long one because I. I, I have a feeling you've, you're you're quite well organised and you might sail through it. But equally, I might get very talky and very excitable about some of the images that you've provided us tonight we, so we could get sidetracked easily yeah. th there's a potential for sidetracking there's a dangerous potential for sidetracking uh, on which note um everyone we will introduce chris after the news but first uh let's look at some pictures of in fact let's look at some graphs uh i'm very excited about this episode it's we're, we're gonna be talking about the very long and very beautiful history of technical drawing everyone that's the plan for this 82nd episode of rail matter so uh, here we are, the, the the trends through COVID. What's been happening in the last week? Well, what's been happening in the last week is, is a bit weird. Once again, like rail has sort of decided to just pitch downwards a little bit for no particular reason. So we're kind of bouncing around the 63% mark. Um, uh, buses have sort of gone up. I, I dare say this is just some weird artifacting. Um, and, and also it'd be interesting to see, this is sort of not showing the, uh, the fuel, the fuel thing, the fuel crisis, uh, so we might see some some things going on that that will change it. But anyway, as ever, we're sort of we have had a long period of like just steady climbing, and then things have gone a bit weird recently. So we'll see. You know, rail uh, rail ridership uh, in relative terms is continuing to climb mostly. Um, we're we're still looking out for the telltale signs of that asymptote. But anyway, oh, I was going to talk about two other things. Uh, so firstly, we talked talked about the fuel. We talked about the fact that people are supposedly jumping onto rail to avoid the fuel thing. The other thing is um, it's kind of a bit of an administrative thing. Uh, today on, on Twitter, I saw a lot of people talking about leisure travel, and uh, this kind of comes down to the way the railway industry categorizes different forms of travel, in that we basically categorize it to all intents and purposes, into two major buckets, which is either business or leisure travel. But business travel, some people don't put business for, for commuting. So sometimes commuting gets bucketed into leisure. Um, business generally only covers people who... People only click business if they're actually like on their way to a meeting, which covers a very small number of actual non-leisure journeys. So leisure is a very poor name for what is basically all other journeys, like, you know... Uh, going shopping, or, uh, or or more importantly, things like students traveling to see family, or people going to see other f friends and family, which isn't just like tourist leisure travel. So uh, yeah, anyway, uh, more on that at some point in the future, I'm sure, because it'd be interesting to unpick why those categories are the way they are. But anyway, interesting chat on Twitter. Right, so, the, oh, before we start on the news, actually, this is fun. <laughs> Chris, we've already talked about this, but I I'm going to play this for the 59 seconds that it lasts, because it's very fun. Don't don't tell anyone you can see the string pulling the train along. I uh, when I saw this on Twitter, it was a day maker. I was quite pleased. Anyway, yeah, no, I'm giving LNER some free advertising. They haven't, they're not going to send me one. I, I wish that was. The, I wish it worked. Like that. But uh, no, I, I thought it was worth playing it because it was silly and fun, and I love the idea. Not only do I love the idea of a of a little wooden, uh, I don't think it is Brio, a little wooden uh, Azuma, but also I love the idea of of KM off of t famous off of Twitter, off of LNER Twitter, um, 
painstakingly putting this video together and pulling the train around with string. I think it's joyous. Anyway, the news. Oh, sorry, Chris. We, it's, I, I talked about segues. It's already gone that way, hasn't it? So, the first, not much news today. Uh, the Elephant and Castle is under siege again. This time it's not fire and explosion. It's a digger uh, half demolishing the uh, tube station uh, concourse. So, brilliant. Leave Elephant and Castle station alone, everyone, for goodness sake. Oh. Um, yeah, anyway, so that's, uh, once again, I don't, I don't know when it's going to be reopened. Hopefully sooner rather than later, but the damage is pretty extensive. Um, oh, Segway. You know I like Segways. Uh, Detoa has just pointed out when uh, Deidre does surveys on trains uh, about how people use their time on a train, we specifically had scope for more options for purpose of travel. Oh, good. Good, I'm glad. Anyway, right. Uh, it is Brio th those trains are Brio compatible, everyone, yes. Anyway, right, so Elephant Castle under siege again. Next news item. Oh, yeah, this is a bit arbitrary. Uh, Tim. Here's Tim collecting his golden pandrel clip. You can, you, the, 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 if I click on, if I go here behind me, you can see the, there's the golden pandrel clip behind me. In fact, Chris, what am I doing? I just went into, there we go, too big. Behind me here, Chris, look, you, there's the, I can always, there it is, the, the golden pandrel clip next to, uh, next to uh, parts one and two of the first uh, beaching report. Uh, you know, pride of place. Um, yeah, there we go. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> uh, yes, Tim has collected his pandle clip, except he hasn't collected it because I stole it right back off him again. Um, and, okay, the big news that everyone's probably more interested in is, um, yeah, what's 25 million between friends? Yes, uh, whoops. Uh, Southeastern has gone down the pan because Go Ahead Group accidentally uh, kept, they accidentally lost 25 million pounds down behind the sofa. So Go Ahead Group have, um, let's say, relinquished the uh, Southeastern contract, uh, franchise contract, which is fine because that's going to be happening. All the contracts are going to be disappearing fairly soon anyway. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. But it does mean that, once again, another operator, Last Resort, is operating another former franchise. So there we go. Talking of the uh, the failures of a fragmented rail industry, here is a drawing by, uh, by Jarvis. Um, actually, no, it's for Jarvis by British Steel when Jarvis built Croydon Tramlink. I also particularly like the fact they appear to have spelt Croydon wrong in this drawing, which is which is particularly good. We're talking about high-quality um, technical drawings. Why have I put this drawing up of a weird junction fish plate between flat bottom and grooved rail? Well, because this episode is about technical drawing. Um, and uh, this felt like a fun excuse. Oh, i tell you what's happened is that I, I put a little white block over the name of the person who designed this. And then what I've done is I've resized said, said drawing. <laughs> Uh, to uh, to uncover the name. It's fine. It doesn't really matter. Sorry, David. Don't worry about it. Anyway, um, <laughs> professional as always. <laughs> because why have I put this up? Well, we're going to be talking about technical drawings with Chris. And so without further ado, I think it's high time. Um, I actually kicked off this episode of, of Rail Matter. Welcome to the show, everyone. <laughs> City 225 fades away. Oh, we get to look at this this stunning, absolutely stunning book. Um, I mean, it looks even better in, in real life. Wait a minute. Uh, let's, let's go. Let's get our two big faces. In fact, let's go for our miniaturized faces to start with. Here is, here's the book uh, in nice kind of uh, beautiful white background. But here is, wait a minute. Oh. I should have brought this over earlier. Do you want me to show you off my one instead? Oh, <laughs> it's here. It's here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's nice. huge, isn't it? It's bigger, it's bigger than our faces. It is bigger than you can see. You're getting a lot of yeah. book for your penny there. It's, mm -hmm. It is bigger than our faces. And it's got some serious chunk. Look at this. Look at this thing. It's, it's, it's got serious chunk. Um, people are asking how long a history is long. Well, we'll get to that, everyone. We will get to that. Um, yeah, this it's... Chris, it's stunning. It is absolutely stunning. But before before I rave about it even more, look at this thing. It's so nice. Um, I've had I've already, it's been my evening book upstairs for quite a while. I've been sneaking it up and like looking through. Anyway, that's sounded seedier than it intended to be. But um, Chris, introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, Chris. Uh, so um, I work in the library and archives at the National Railway Museum. Um, my day job is getting out material from the archives for 
uh, digitization. So uh, mainly for um, people that need drawings for research. Uh, so it's sort of an on-demand service rather than project dig digitization, uh, which we also do. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, um, aside from that, I wrote a book. You did, and it's a very beautiful book. I, I, I said it's very, very beautiful. It is insightful. Like there is text in this. You haven't just basically copy pasted all your TIFF images into a book and then sold it. Like no, no, mm. you, you have actually gone into great detail. It's some really nice. Let's, here's here's a nice mm. one. Like hold this up and not and not break it. You can see. Look, everyone. Look, there is text as well. Look, large mm. amounts of text. Really, and it and it is. Insi it's very insightful. It's really nicely put together. It's. It's, it's brilliant. It's really, really good, Chris. I've enjoyed thumbing through it. I'm very pleased that there is a decent infrastructure representation. The uh, the the quite well, in fact, talking of which, there is a, there is a drawing of the um, the Liverpool to Manchester there, looking fantastic. So infrastructure mm. does get a mention. It's not all it's not all locomotives. Uh, the it's not even it, that's not even the actual Liverpool and Manchester because it's the it's George Stevenson's original plan which got rejected by Parliament because it wasn't any good. This is the this is the stuff you will learn, folks. If you get the book, also it's the hardback is lovely. It's got a really nice textured dust cover. It's very nice. They've done a very they've done a good job on this one. I'm now going to have to find somewhere that I can put it safely. That's not going to collapse off the table. Uh, that's teetering, but it's fine. I can grab it later if I need to. So, oh, let's go. Let's get our miniaturized faces up. Um, throughout the yeah, for anyone watching, you can always at me in to, to so if you at me into the comments, um, you can ask uh, Chris or I questions. Mostly Chris, let's face it. I've, I've got nothing useful to say here. Um, uh, but without further ado, Chris, um, there is your book. We'll talk about the book again at the end, uh, I think, just to, just in case anyone's like, wait, he hasn't, they haven't given us the discount code yet. We'll, we'll do that at the end. In the meantime, let's press on. So, we're st I mean, we start, I've realized our face is going to be over things. So if you think our face is over something, Chris, when you look at this, tell me and I'll switch them off temporarily. But um, we start with well and tell us about what we start with first of all i'll, I'll do both of us we're going to try and tag team doing audio description uh because one of us will forget uh so this is um a rather i think mean, you can tell us in the details but it is a rather nice hand drawn what looks like it looks a little bit like watercolor and ink actually um of the northeastern railways tea rooms at york station which are currently mm. an excellent pub and for a while had a model railway in it but um tell us about this drawing tell us more about this drawing chris Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a rather beautiful color wash drawing. Uh, actually, it, this one I have to give credit doesn't come from the National Railway Museum. Uh, mm -hmm. Network Rail were uh, have a huge archives in York as well, uh, and their archivist was ever so kind to me at the early stages of the book, let me having a whole day just roaming around the place. Oh, yeah. Pulling, pulling open drawers, opening up boxes, trying to find uh, extra things to add to the book, uh, and this was one of them. Uh, there's even there's a companion drawing with it in the book as well, which is the cross sections through the centre of the tea rooms. Yeah, it's just um, it's just stunning. There's some, some lovely details in it. So, for example, the details here are showing the arch, showing the arch vaults, kind of uh, kind of going along here, which are really nice um it's just it's just lovely it's a really lovely drawing yeah the uh station roof goes right through the middle of the tea rooms yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah um but i think it's a uh, uh the, the next few set of drawings we've got um and this is the first one is to sort of give an idea of the different types of drawings that you get um so we've got uh, the first one there is a fairly typical architectural drawing. Um, our next one here is uh, the York and North Midland Railways track. I think it was around 1830s, this drawing. It, yes, I think so, 1830, yeah, Bob on 1830. Uh, this is a P-way drawing, everyone. There are on here no less than two different forms of permanent way. There is, well, I'm very pleased about it. I should have put the cross-section drawing up, actually. I've got cross-section drawing. Actually, I'm going to momentarily hide our faces. I've got cross-section drawings that I do nowadays that are similar to this because on here I can see, so you can see that the, the formation has got this sort of shape. I've exaggerated it slightly. For drainage purposes, we call that cross-fall. 
And you can see here, there's the, there's the peak of the cross fault here. You can see the drainage uh, here. There's this, this kind of a drainage system has been built. It's brilliant. I love this. Also, you know, it's that the, um, that the uh, ballast, back in these days, they were fixated by the idea that the ballast went up to the top of the rail level rather than what we do now, which is running up to the top of sleeper level. So, um, yeah, loads of interesting stuff on this drawing. Um, love it. Mm. I, I love the the variety in in this as well that you've got the uh, you've got the f what familiar uh, sleepered rail, but you've also got the uh, the rail on the stone on these, blocks as well. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine. Uh, the only thing holding those rails there is just the weight of the stone, isn't it? Trains in were super light, so it, it was mm. fine. Yeah, and, and, and interestingly enough, like this, what's quite interesting is that. Actually, the 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 the, the most modern for, like track form is nowadays. It's actually closer to this than it is to this. Okay, we still have sleepers and you know sleeper track pretty much everywhere. It's ubiquitous, but modern slab track is closer in design form actually to to this stuff, to the um to the kind of the sing the kind of the stone blocks under each base plate. So um yeah, it's quite interesting. This is great. I love this drawing and, and the level of the color that the fact they've gone. You know what the cross section here. It's going to look like the real thing sliced. We're not going to we're not going to go for poxy sort of printed, you know, minim, minimal colors or anything like this. No, no, no. We are going to go absolutely to town, and this thing's going to look like the real the real deal. It's it's, it's, it's beautiful work. Yeah, the nineteenth uh, century engineers had a lot of time on their hands. <laughs> <laughs> you could say that, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. So this yeah. is a, a sort of civil permanent way example um our next one is a good example of a mechanical engineering drawing um yes. so i thought instead of giving you a train this early on uh, or a locomotive <laughs> let's go with uh, a great northern railway omnibus a uh, horse-drawn omnibus uh, i think this is oh, I've 1881 yeah no, it's 81. 1881 yeah yeah so it's but again beautiful color wash uh, this would have been the original draftsman's work. Uh, there would have been multiple copies of this made and distributed to the works. We'll get onto the copying process towards the end. Um, it's, uh, it's, mm. it's this uh, this one strikes me because of how high quality the draftsmanship is. Like it looks like it has been generated in CAD. You know the the quality of the of the draftsmanship is absolutely. It, I mean, it is exquisite, absolutely exquisite. It really is. The time that's gone not just into the colouring, but the shading to give you yeah. the sense of depth, uh, which isn't really necessary for what totally the drawing is trying to perform. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Completely yeah. superfluous, but they've gone for it anyway. Yeah, mm. it really is lovely. You don't need the uh, the shading to tell you that the wheels are round, yeah. but it's there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then the next one I get very excited about because this is this is this is more like the sort of thing that I generate day to day, which is kind of a big plan. Uh, I mean, the color again. We've got lots. We've got reds, yellows, but it's more the colors are making. They're they're more referring to a thing rather than being realistic colors. It's like this is a road. This is a building. This is prepared ground, and these blue lines are tracks. You know, it's it's kind of that. That's the that's the arrangement, and it yeah. Tell, so tell us what this drawing is a bit about it. So this drawing is a land plan. Uh, so all of the color coding gives you the details of uh, who owns the building and the land, uh, what they're used for. Uh, you have lots of annotations on here that give you the details of all the rents paid on the buildings. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, this being Malabone, it's quite. Uh, with uh, 1899 thereabouts, isn't it, that Marlebone opened? That's it, yeah. And the extension. Uh, so, yeah, this, uh, we've got see, these, uh, the size of this drawing is, uh, to say it's big is, is an understatement that um, that it's in a bound book, where you can see the fold down the yeah, middle. Yeah. That opens out to about A0 size. Oh, my goodness, okay, yeah. So you can imagine, so, that, so the book itself is, about, is slightly larger than A1. Yeah, not not that they were not that they're working to standard paper sizes. These these yonks before standard paper sizes were being used. But it, but I mean this thing is huge. I mean it's yeah absolutely massive. The detail again the detail is wonderful. You've got all these ground rents. This is quite an interesting drawing as well because you can see where the state the intended expansion of the station 
might have been. You can see uh, the space that was essentially bought by the railway with the intention of there being more tracks, you know, and, and Marylebone being a more substantial station. It's it's yeah, it's really nice. Um, yeah, that's lovely. The, 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 there's another drawing associated with this in the book, um, which I really love because it, it shows the approach into the station uh, where the line and the tunnels go underneath Lord's Cricket Ground, oh, yeah. which was a huge bone of contention at the time that this the, the extension was being built uh, and still to this day is a is a matter of uh dispute i would say <laughs> some controversy <laughs> yeah indeed yes yeah. crikey um actually we've had an interesting question from gareth williams uh, and maybe you can briefly answer this in fact i'll bring our large faces up because it will allow me to do a little bit of admin while that happens which is um gareth williams asks how big is the railway museum archive compared to network rails and are there other big railway archives that's an interesting question oh uh that is a really good question um uh so the railway museum has about a million engineering drawings roughly it's a it's a very rough estimate we we still have a very long task in terms of cataloging all of that material uh, so we don't know exactly um i believe network rails is around six million. Oh, wow so that that is a lot and um, it makes sense because if you think about rolling stock rolling stock goes everywhere uh, and the predominantly drawings we hold in the museum are rolling stock based because anything that is uh, um, architectural or civil in nature is probably still in use yeah i was going to say we need as engineers we, we access them. that and play with it still to, to check how built things have been put together so yeah technically we kind of need to still have responsibility over it exactly so uh but they will retain their but because it's location specific there's a lot just a lot more material that is produced to make that make that work because there'd be location specific drawings rather than rolling stock which can go all over the place there are other deposit uh, depositories out there uh most of the drawings that were produced post mid 1960s uh have actually been retained by the industry mm. uh they're held in the we threw quite a lot out at privatization mm. uh yeah yeah <laughs> uh so the rdds um hold uh quite a lot of material in derby hmm. uh, what's going to happen to that material in the future it's hard to judge at the moment um uh, what well, well, that's that we'll see in the future obviously it's with so much rolling stock having changed in the last three or four years there's much less demand for it now yeah 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 yeah, there's yeah in terms of i mean the way that archive for both infrastructure and rolling stock drawings the the, the commercial you know the commercial ownership but also the risk that they disappear and get lost, either maliciously or by kind of incompetence, is quite that's, that's quite a high risk for some of these things. And yeah, I have to say, I do worry. Um, anyway, mm. right, we shall go back to here because prepare yourselves because there's another type of drawing that Chris is going to talk to us about. Yeah, so uh, not a kind of drawing that you find in a railway context very often, but since I want to talk about technical drawing in a much broader sense, uh, we've got one of Leonardo da Vinci's drawings here of uh, a fetus uh, in the womb. Uh, da Vinci was famous for the quality of his drawings, mm. really fantastic uh, quality that he was producing. The uh, and technical drawing was a very important part of uh, the scientific and anatomical drawing up until uh, well into the to the end of the 19th century and, and still in limited occasions still today obviously photography's uh replaced it in a lot of cases but looking back historically it was a really important part of technical drawing as well it's yeah i mean the, the, the drawing quality is absolutely spectacular it really is i mean his his work his his, his work <laughs> here is exquisite uh to the point of like almost being a bit like wincy like it's squeamishly good sort of his level I and mean, all of his anatomical drawings are like this this brings back horrifying memories for me because uh, i used to serve canapes and drinks in the royal college of surgeons when i was a student 
Um, and I'm not even going to describe on air the level of horror of some of the things that were wax preserved from various Napoleonic wars in glass boxes around me um, mm. while I'm there serving kind of nibbles. Uh, <laughs> Royal College of Surgeons is a very weird place and it puts me in mind of this. Anyway, right, so... And then the next thing, actually, is this is one of mine that I've dumped up because I wanted to put a bit of context in why I'm interested in this subject particularly. Because I mean, I'm interested in this subject because it's absolutely fascinating, but I suppose I have a personal interest in this, isn't it? Generally, the way I communicate most of my day job is via technical drawings. So I do this stuff. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I do drafting. I still do. In fact, I was supporting some people. I, I, theoretically, I shouldn't be on the tools anymore because of where I, what the sort of work I generally do. But every now and then I drop back in to help kick something out the door. And indeed, that's the sort of, I was doing that earlier this week and last week. Uh, and this is one of my drawings here um, from quite a while ago now, actually, like about four years ago. But um, yeah, so these are the sorts of drawings I create. I have deliberately made this smaller so it's not quite so obvious where it is because, you know, commercial sensitivities, etc. But um, yeah, so this is what this I'm very interested to know where that art form, because it is an art form, as much as it has a technical purpose, mm. it's certainly an art form, where that art form came from. So, Chris... Mm. On to the next image. And in fact, interestingly, you've, you've popped another image up here, which is, again, we've got another, which is, <laughs> you can see the parallels between the different, I, I like this, I, I picked these, this one because it, it nicely shows the similarities of, of, of technical drawing kind of through the years. But anyway, right, onwards. Yeah, so I think it's uh, probably useful to talk a bit about why engineer, uh, engineering drawings and technical drawing is important, why it actually matters. Uh, and what the world would be like without it. Uh, because pre-19th century, uh, you a lot of engineering was sort of a cottage, cottage industry. Mm. And the one of the most useful and important parts of technical drawing is specialization of the roles in the process of manufacturing. Uh, it essentially allows the engineer to communicate the information that they need to about uh, whatever needs to be built or constructed uh, to someone else. If they didn't have technical drawing, if you can imagine all, all, all the detail that you can see in front of you in this mm. image having to be explained to someone either verbally or in text, uh, it would be a challenge. And what tended to happen before when people didn't have the skills to produce this kind of material is that they were, the engineers were on site managing uh, every part of the process. It's interesting. There's, there's an interesting little, uh, uh, we've all, we said we were going to segue and I've already started another one. I'm so sorry. But what's interesting is that we, legally, we still have to create a written description of our railway infrastructure when it is part of a, an act uh, that's, that has to pass through Parliament. So HS2, for example, is within the hybrid bill is a written verbal description of the alignment. And actually, there's a tool within a, my design software has a button that I press to output the, the text in the correct mm -hmm. manner that then gets put into the act. It's uh, very strange. But I mean, it's all, that's almost like a bizarre legal hanger on now. It doesn't actually, no one actually reads that. But I dare say it's from a time where it was considered that it was still prudent to provide a written explanation of the works um, because not because, you know, you perhaps didn't have or people didn't have access to the drawing. So they felt it necessary to provide that written written version. It's a very weird way to represent something that's physical and, and, and has dimensions within space. It's very bizarre to to not have a drawing for those. But actually, as you say, it, it was a novel idea at one point. I think uh, going into... Uh, speculation territory it probably also was about literacy in terms of uh, not in terms of reading literacy but in terms of ability to read the drawings and the mm -hmm. plans because if you think about MPs and Lords that had to look at um, look at the proposals uh, and anyone that wanted to give evidence in it for or against them they wouldn't necessarily be able to understand uh, what the plans were about and what they meant. So uh, a written description that came along with it may have been more important at the time. And uh, yeah, so 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 I, 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 forgetting to audio describe, this is this is Derby, right? This is uh, mm -hmm. looks like one of the one of the major. In fact, it's the plan of the the Derby locomotive works um, and the station 
and offices and St Andrew's Goods Depot, all, all of that. Uh, let me see, so, yeah. Somewhere on there is the actual drawing office in which this drawing was produced as yeah. well, which <laughs> I find lovely and meta. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and you can see, I mean, you can see this, the scale is is. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 I mean, the scale of the infrastructure is, is terrific. You've got, you've got one, two, at least th- four, five, six turntables. Uh, goodness knows how many point ends. Uh, it's just a very complicated layout. Um, and it's, it's and it's only and it's only half of Derby because the carriage works are off off to the off off in another direction. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't the full. This isn't the full shape. If people are familiar with the shape of the railway through Darbados, um, yeah, this is only half of it, and it's still a tremendously complicated drawing. Yeah, it's it's, it's brilliant. Uh, oh yeah, the the drawing office is at the top here by London Road. By the look of it, actually, I think mm. I think I might be wrong. There, there's some drawing offices there. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think that's it. Yeah. And that's the CME, the the Civil Mechanical Engineering Department offices there. And then, and then a very small building for the research department. That, what, this, it got bigger. Yes, it did. <laughs> in Derby. Mm. Uh, yes. Anyway, I, again, a digression. That's British Railways era. Um, mm. So, right, prod me when you want me to jump to the next slide. So uh, let's let's go to the next. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so another important part of uh, engineering drawing is experimentation, mm. because if you uh, it's a lot cheaper to experiment with something on a piece of paper than it is to build the real thing, prototypes or or models, uh, wherever you can. And this is a rather nice drawing. This is um, uh, one from George Stevenson of, of Locomotion uh, from the Stockton and Darlington. And it's quite difficult to pick out on this image, but... Uh, it, there are lots of pe- odd pencil, rubbed out pencil marks and scratchings all over it that suggest that there are lots of other ideas about what locomotion was going to be and how it was going to work. Um, between the uh, the wheels, I think there is a faint um, gear. Uh, yeah, I'm just there. actually colour adjusting the image to possibly help. There, I've just color just adjusted mm. the image to make it a little clearer. You can see the you can see the cog wheel between them here. Uh, this you can just see it here. This is it, right? Yeah. There you are, and you see the other outline at the other end there. There we go. So, one of the advantages of being able to do a technical drawing is that you can map out how components move and interact with each other, uh, which makes the process quite a bit quicker. Uh, rather than having to produce a model. Not that it's totally replaced model making by any means. There's lots of model making going on. Uh, um, uh, But it did speed up the process um, and helped engineers to conceptualise what they were were building. Yeah, it's interesting. This is true for... um, This is certainly true for the drafting process for physical infrastructure as well, because part of that drafting process, where we're placing things that we know need to be placed on, on on the track, such as things like joints and uh, other line side features actually that process allows you to spot issues and and and, and conceptualize where by the process of draw of doing the drawing actually we're spotting how the infrastructure fits together so this is as true for physical infrastructure as it is for mechanical equipment and, and, and machines um yeah and also allows for what we call clash detection so so checking that you know different disciplines things aren't bumping into each other so yeah it's interesting that 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 uh that is has is still true for drawings today. Um, a couple of the other sort of useful things with engineering drawings was, uh, in terms of the communication aspects, was first the ability to communicate over distance. Mm. Uh, that you could roll up a set of drawings, send them wherever they needed to go, and then uh, the construction could be done locally. Uh, and that was going on into back in the 18th century, Bolton and Watt with their atmospheric engines, which could be building sized. There was no, ch- <laughs> yeah. you know, pre- pre-railways, there was no chance of being able to take those engines over long distance. <laughs> um, so you mean low, you... low pressure steam engines of the of kind of the, yeah, the mm-hmm. what, what era? Yeah. yeah. So they, uh, they would quite often pack up their drawings, send them to the site of where they needed to be, and then it would be local engineers that produced, uh, produced the engines from those drawings. Mm. Um, and the other aspect that is 
perhaps easy to forget is communication over time. Uh, whether it's being able to record how a machine works so you can repair and modify it in the future, make spare parts, standardizing parts between different generations, uh, backwards compatibility, um, and also just for the historical record for researchers looking at the drawings now. Yeah, we've got we've got immediately got very Doctor Who because the the reason you know these technical drawings their purpose is to transcend major purpose is to transcend dimensions of space and time uh <laughs> yes. which uh yeah which is quite fun so mm. let's now if we go on to the next pair of images mm. these are lovely so, yes. tell us about tell us chris tell us about these these are from our general electric uh collection and uh, which includes all of the General Electric Company's predecessors, um, here this example being English Electric. These were uh, produced for uh, as concept designs for uh, the locomotives that were exported to Egypt in 1947. So these are contemporary to LMS 10,000, 10,001, the first successful mainline express passenger diesels. Um, it looks so. F I mean, this particularly the one on this side. Uh, it looks so. Uh, oh, I've managed to attempt to print out that web page. Uh, it looks so. This this one here. Uh, wait a minute. Where's my scribble? My scribble device is. There we are. Uh, this one here. It just looks so futuristic. Look at this. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, Guess. Do you know which one they built? They picked one of these. Uh, actually, I think that it ended up looking mostly like. Didn't it ended up more, looking more like that, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Yeah, but that was the design that they went with in the end. It's uh, need to do some more investigation because this this very much the 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 left hand one is very much sort of English Electric's house style for a lot of their export locos, and not that dissimilar to um, with the the large bonnets at the front that you'd get on say the thirty sevens and the Deltics. Yeah, I was gonna say it looks a bit with the go faster stripe, it looks a bit del a bit Deltic prototype. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh but the the reason I picked out these is that they're actually sort of examples of the process of sort of the sales mm. work that uh engineers were doing because they were produced designs that needed to be put in front of uh their clients to say, hey this is what we can build for you. Um, so it's uh, it's their input, input. The communication isn't just with engineering drawings between uh, engineers. Uh, it's also being used to demonstrate things, and you can think of examples of the, in architecture where you'll produce sort of a um, architect's conceptual design yeah. for planning process and things like that. What I like about these two is that it's like already the curse of of the render. Is, is drawing in like the the final locomotive was never going to look anything like either of these and yet it's like it's that it's that is exactly it's the, the curse of the artist's impression right they're, they're generating multiple twitter accounts and column pages of like how much the render is nothing like the final product and, and we and, and engineers and, and planners and architects do a bad job of mis-selling things um, indeed i've ranted about these things in fact i think i did on the hyperloop episode um, it's very easy to create a render uh, and yeah, I'd say nowadays we're even more guilty of it. In fact, fundamentally much more guilty of it than ever we were in the past. But uh, yeah, it doesn't make these any less beautiful to look at, I have to say. Um, we've had an interesting question, which I think both of us can probably answer. You, having having worked your way through the archives, you can probably describe the, the what you did see. But um, uh, so there is, I've lost the question now. Where has it gone? It, it, it just moved. But there's a question. I can't see who it was, but it was basically what uh, what materials were used to, drew, to do these drawings. I think it was from B Crossing. Uh, what materials were used to actually create, you know, what in the in, in the main, what, what material is being used? Mm. Is it mostly paper or, or what else? So the, uh, the ones you've got in front of you here are on tracing paper. Uh, the... Uh, original draftsman's work would usually be onto some form of cartridge paper. It was quite often linen backed if it was being retained. Uh, that's where you get the colour wash drawings, uh, the really beautiful ones. Yeah. They weren't particularly useful for uh, what was actually being sent to the works, but for drawing, uh, for actual manufacturing. 
because you needed to make lots of copies. So they would be traced from the originals onto some other medium. Uh, Pre-1860s, you would just be making lots and lots and lots of tracings and sending those off. Once you get the invention of blueprinting, you can uh, the, you produce either tracing paper copies like these or you produce copies on waxed linen. So that's a linen sheet that's had wax applied to it to make it translucent and then that's used in the blueprinting process. Ah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. All ah, right, yeah, good question. And thanks, thanks for the answer. I was going to say, yeah, uh, paper is, is, and tracing paper was certainly used a lot in technical drawing even until quite recently you'd use the tracing paper because you could overlay it with different different um you know essentially it was like using layers on in modern CAD work you know different levels of layers um so and there is there's another reason you, you've you popped here another reason for um for why we have drawings and it kind of relates mm -hmm. to what we were talking about the law earlier yeah so the other reason that you produce drawings would be for regulation so for example like we talked about before submitting plans to parliament but it could also be for creating patents um, and being able to record your patent as your sort of proof of design uh, and your ownership over that design uh, and also submitting plans where necessary to prove that your designs are safe. Um, but I think there's a report, uh, RAIB report from a few years back that includes a drawing from uh, the museum's collection. Uh, there was an incident where one of the bullies dropped uh i think it was its conrod um it was uh, yeah um the it was very lucky because it fell onto the third rail which propped it up oh, right, if, it right. wasn't, if, if it wasn't on the third rail section it probably would have dug into the ballast between a sleeper and thrown the entire train on the deck oh, dear. Uh, it was a very nasty p potential for a very nasty accident uh, so uh but the we provided a drawing of, I think it was one of the cotters um, that was suspected to be the cause of the failure. Uh, because there are quite a few um, bully Pacifics out there still um, on the main line. Uh, and being able to ensure that they there's the access to the design there to, to for their safe operation uh, is a really important part uh, of what the drawings can be used for. Mm. So... Pushing on, it's already it's already quarter to eight. Good grief! We, yes, uh, we, we're, we we're going to get we're going to change up a gear. Um, this is a, an object without a head. Tell us about this headless object. So um, we kind of do. Uh, we said we talk about the very long history of engineering drawing. <laughs> uh, so this is the world's first example of a technical drawing. Uh, um, this is a statue of Prince Gudea, uh, a set of a, um, several, I think it's 20 or more statues of him uh, from a temple in the city of Lagash in 2130 BCE. So it well, 4,000 years ago. Yeah, correct. We're not, this is the oldest surviving, but we think that engineering drawing have been going on for quite some time. In fact, this isn't the actual drawing. It's just represented in the statue. And this is the plan of the temple in which the statue was found. Oh, nice. And it's, yeah, so this is so this is a statue of someone sat in a quite a nice looking chair, actually. It's pretty snap. It's quite a weird, like, Scandi vibe chair, which is quite <laughs> something for, for 2000 BC. Um, and they've got on their lap a tablet. Uh, I mean, it looks literally like a Wacom tablet because it's got a stylus on top of it. And on the tablet... Is a is what looks like a mason's cross section of of a temple. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. got the outlines of the of the walls, um, and and the actual thing we're looking at is a an artist's impression from much more recently. I would I dare say, um, mm. but it's uh, but it's it's remarkable. So it's clearly quite they're quite proud if they're putting it into a statue. They're quite proud of the fact this is happening. You know, quite proud of the, of this work. So yeah, it's quite interesting. So. Um, Mm. Yeah, so that's that's really nice. So that's so that's that, that's the some of the some of the distant mm. origins. Yeah, so that's uh, that's where it goes back to. It probably went before then. Mm. Um, we can imagine that they probably architects were producing drawings for great pyramids, 
things like that. They were yeah. the the to put that in context, twenty one thirty BCE, you were only about five hundred years after the sort of end of the early stages of evolution of writing. Yeah, so quite soon after writing <laughs> We're doing technical it, drawing. Yeah, we're doing technical drawing. Yeah, You're like oh, that was that writing's dreadful. Let's just draw it again. Yeah, it's yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we're not so, we're not that far away from pictograms and things like that. Yeah, and yeah, fair point. Moving on from there, you had um, Roman architects as well. We're producing lots of drawings. We don't have any of the drawings, but we have writings referring to the fact that they were producing lots of drawings. Mm. Um, and this sort of early drawings that would be being produced were what are described as perspective drawings uh, of which this is a much more modern example um, from Waterloo uh, this is the booking hall uh, but it's but it's very different from the more technical drawings that we imagine now yes it's it's it, unlike either isometric or or orthographic uh drawings which we'll talk we'll touch on in a minute unlike those mm. types of drawings um this has a vanishing point so everything yeah hence the name of perspective and it's a really nice uh, i mean it's just an absolutely stunning perspective drawing of but also showing some very dramatic sort of uh uh sort of yeah uh romanesque and 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 greek sort of uh, revival architecture going on crikey mm. uh, along with some sort of Actually, if it's it, it'll be pre-art deco stylings, but it's sort of the it's it's the it, it's the sort of um, hinting at that sort of uh, type of uh, of architecture going on. Anyway, I digress. Mm. Lovely. Yeah. So I, I I just put this into sort of contrast with what what we sort of seeing throughout the rest. Sure, but this yeah. this style of drawing would would have been much closer to what was being produced early on for technical purposes. Um, and then if we go to the next one mm, oh crikey yeah <laughs> just to give a uh, i only picked this out as a as a random example of, of a much more modern <laughs> style uh this in fact uh, so it's an orthographic projection which uh it's difficult for me to explain some of the more technical aspects of this because uh having not been actually a draftsman myself uh there's a lot of jargon uh, that you tend to get things like perspective orthographic projections and isometric yeah. projections. But uh, the bare bones of what we're talking about is where a 3D object is projected with parallel lines onto a plane. Uh, to So if you can imagine a, um, just a, a, imagine a piece of paper put behind an object and then you draw parallel lines from that object to that piece of paper. Mm. And that is the bare bones of... of description of, of what's going on so if i have my sheet of paper here and then i've got some sort of object here whatever it happens to be i've just drawn a pyramid for some reason uh you essentially draw you do it in and then you draw uh, and then likewise here you draw the shape uh da -da 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 -da, as you as you see it and then and then you might add like you know hidden lines based on what you can see but anyway that's that's how the drawing works that's that's the projection um we, I should. Two things have struck me. Firstly, by the way, this is a this is a third angle projection drawing, an orthographic drawing of uh, the tract hovercraft of um, of Lathwaite's uh, modified and updated version of the tract hovercraft. You can see well, the very um, distinctive infrastructure mm. here. This this thing, or a version of this thing, uh, is sat in Peterborough for people to laugh at as they go past it. Um, yeah, a bit of yeah. It's it's not it's not the 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 one here is not the same as the one in Peterborough. There are, no, it's uh, not. It's a, this is a snazzier. Uh, mm. version of it um, because uh, it's, uh, mm. it's it's and the less... interesting thing about this is that this is a drawing from AEI uh, and as far as I can tell I, I can't find any references to them ever being involved with a project at Peterborough so this I there's a whole set of drawings that were produced for this lots of different ideas going on mm. but um yeah, so so I'm I'm hope I'm now I've put it out there. I'm hoping someone is going to come to tell come to me and say, "Oh, I know what this was." Um... Yeah, bring <laughs> us your answers, everyone. And the mm. the other th the other point I thought of is we keep both of us keep saying draftsman. Uh, as we'll come to later, we should be saying draft person uh, for all sorts of reasons, but also very much it isn't you know 
it's 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 a weird it's one of those weird ones that's just proof that how embedded like gendered terms are like both of us are saying draftsman but we mean draft person um or, or drafter drafter is yep mm. uh, doing drafting rather like i was saying draftsmanship but actually like drafting quality draft yeah like we need to yeah so i'm yeah. going to correct us both on this one we're going to try we, and we say do draft need to person, update the language on it definitely we do don't we um so yes uh one of the so unknown tracked hovercraft that isn't RT, RTV thirty one. Uh, mm. It looks smaller and uh, more like a hyperloopy pod type thing because it's got about two seats in it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Sixteen seats. Yeah, this is pretty much just a hyperloop pod. Anyway, right. Mm. I, 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 another digression is coming. Uh, so we're going to quickly jump to the next drawing. <laughs> ah, it's not a drawing though because. Hey. Yes, a wild Gaspard Monge appears in the story. <laughs> um, Tell us about Gaspard Monge. So, uh, Gaspard Monge is credited as the father of descriptive geometry. Um, I'll get, get onto what descriptive geometry is, or at least my best explanation of it in a bit. Uh, but Monge, he, just to give him a bit of background, he's born in 1746 in France. Um, he's father's a merchant so he's from a wealthy well-to-do family but not a noble family hmm. which is important to what happens to his early career and okay. um, so he has he he's from wealthy family so he gets a good education um, he would have been schooled in the classics and uh, he really enjoyed his mathematics um, and he wants to go into the military but because he doesn't have that noble background, he can't train as an officer. To be an officer in the French military, you needed to be uh, from a noble background. Mm. Um, but one route that is open to him is to train as um, a drafter. Um, or that would have been at that stage entirely draftsman. Um, uh, and, but with his educated background, um, he's familiar with uh, Descartes' uh, coordinate geometry, which is fairly recent at that point. Mm. Um, and uh, he is given the task of um, producing some plans for a fort, and he's been trained in how to do it, and it's he looks at the method that everyone else is doing. I think they're called figured plans. It's a very strange process that they were doing at the, at the time to produce these drawings yeah. and thoughts it took absolutely forever and he goes oh I'll, I'll do it my own way finishes his work really quickly to the point that when he hands it in they say they tell him oh you, you can't have done it spent enough time on this it's not it won't be good enough <laughs> until they look at it and go oh wait this this actually is really good um <laughs> well at least that's the story it, 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 it's probably his own telling so he may have embellished it a little oh, yeah. ever so far, um, embellished yeah yeah um and he very quickly gets recognized for his skill and within a few years uh, he goes from a pr being an apprentice to becomes a professor at the age of 23 at which point he's, a, he's yes um, and he starts teaching all of his uh, descriptive geometry um, all his methods um, to all the new apprentices in the schools very quickly um, so if we go to the next image. Yeah. Aha! Oh, oh crikey. Yeah. Uh, so on the left, we've got uh, one of the examples from one of his books describing descriptive geometry. Um, uh, it's uh, based around coordinate geometry uh, as a method to produce drawings and it's sort of pulling together sort of work it being able to produce drawings from basic mathematical principles uh, and on the right you've got an example of one of the drawings he produced in a book which gave instructions on how, produ how to produce uh, cannons I mean, these and the machinery required for, for making them as well yeah I mean these, can th these drawings are absolutely stunning I particularly like the geometry one. It's just it's the mathematics behind. I mean, I don't. Yeah, it looks almost like some of the mathematics used to generate some of the stuff that that you know, like Hallard style track drawings. You know, it's but it's it's very beautiful. I, it's quite spectacular. And then the uh, again the detail that's gone into that 
very sophisticated looking cannon is uh, is something else. It's uh, wowzer. Uh, it's a beautiful hand, like like kind of hand hand drawn works of art, really. So in in France, his his methods are sort of considered revolutionary. Uh, he uh, begins teaching all of these methods in the military, and they're they're considered so important that they're made a military secret. So nothing of his his work is published outside of the French military and the navy until uh, right towards the um, end of the 18th century. Mm. Only after the French Revolution, um, in which Monge ref- uh, rises quite significantly, at some point he becomes the um, Minister of the Marine, essentially the oh, head wow. of the French Navy. So he really is a, a he really is an important man. Um, for a while at least, he heads off to Egypt with Napoleon in the campaign. Um, he's He has a very interesting career. Um, but of course, only after, only in about 1795 to 1799 does his methods actually get published um, widely. By which point, Britain and France are not exactly best friends. No. <laughs> Uh, so one of the interesting questions for, that we look at now is how much influence does this new revolutionary technique that's appeared in France and starts very quickly spreading throughout the whole of continental Europe, mm. how much does that have an effect on Britain where we're just heading into the peak of the Industrial Revolution? where it's all starting to get going and within a couple of decades we're we're into the railway revolution and the railway mania well yeah indeed so here is another man who Mm. uh is interesting in in this tale um, for a variety of reasons but is is anglo-french right yes uh actually well he's he's only the anglo bit comes later should we say he, ah, so he's, okay. he's bought. <laughs> so this, this is, is uh, this is Mark Brunel, everyone. Mm-hmm. The better uh, Brunel. Yeah, yes, uh, <laughs> the less famous but much more interesting one, I think. Yes. Um, although, how interesting? Well, we'll we'll get on to it. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Mark is born in 1769. Um, his father is a farmer with a very large farm so it's uh, you know for, for, as a farmer's goes he's reasonably wealthy um uh mark isn't the first son the usually the first son were he would inherit the farm and then traditionally this family would send their second son into the church and any more sons after that disappeared into the church unless um the first son would pass away before inheriting so mark goes off to learn uh, in the church but he's really not interested in religion at all he's much more interested in making stuff so he uh, he's really into his carpentry uh, machines I think he, at some point there's a story that he sees uh, an early steam engine arriving in France from Britain gets him really super interested in it and he finds a teacher uh, in his um, ch- schooling uh, in the church that recognises his interest in and gives it, gives it a bit of a nurture um, and eventually persuades uh, Mark's father to let him go off and study um, engineering and drawing and all of these kind of things. So he goes off to study uh, with a man called Professor Vincent Dulagu. I've probably messed up the pronunciation there, but I can't criticise. Um, he uh, um, uh, and it's almost certain at that point, given that he's now in uh, learning at a naval school, that he's being exposed to Monge's descriptive geometry techniques. Mm. And Mark becomes really famous for later on for the quality of his drawings. Um, I think some came up for sale uh, in an auction a few years, uh, two or three years ago, and they really were stunning. 
uh, ones up being sold by the family. Um, so at the age of 17, he joins the Navy, uh, goes on a six year voyage around the Caribbean. Don't really know much about what he gets up to. Uh, but within those six years, he comes back in 1792 and all hell has broken loose in France because we're now midway through the French Revolution. And unlike Monge, who does really well out of the revolution, Mark is from a, a staunch royalist area. The family's all royalist. Whoa. Yeah, not a great time. Um, uh, his future wife, Sophie Kingdom, um, enters the story at this point. She is a teenager who's been sent off by her, um, her brother because both her, family, uh, both her parents have passed away. She's sent by her brother to France to learn French. Really terrible timing. Yeah. <laughs> um, at some point, uh, so she stays for a while with Mark um, in the house where he's boarding um, with who I, a man who I believe was either the deputy or the deputy envoy or the envoy to the USA. Oh, interesting. Uh, so, oh, crikey. Yeah. So they, he has connections. Um, <laughs> they're, stay, um, they're staying in Rouen. Um, and that's the uh, point where things start to get really scary. Uh, Mark makes his escape, but Sophie doesn't. She ends up in a convent where people are being beheaded on a regular basis. Okay, um, luckily, she survives for what happens in the story later. Um, Mark takes advantage of his uh, position in the Navy and his connections with the envoy to get himself a passport to the USA under the pretense of going off to obtain grain for the Navy with no intention of ever coming back. <laughs> <laughs> um, supposedly, this is where um, he actually meets Monge, although Mark does have a reputation for aggrandizement and telling a few interesting tales but it's like this is funny it's like we've, we've got the, the characters that we're going through here is like they're getting successively more uh <laughs> successively better at embellishing their stories exactly yeah so he's off to um he's on his way to la havre and suppose supposedly was thrown off of his horse um and gets picked up by monge in his carriage and given a lift to la havre <laughs> So possibly they possibly they met, and Monge at this point would have been the um, minister of the marines. So yeah, uh, head of the um, navy basically, right? The head of the navy picked up this young lad that was uh, trying to escape the country, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's worth pointing I, out at this point for those because we've we've not particularly already described Mark Brunel. He is a dish. Uh, mm. He is a lot better looking than his son ends up being. Sorry, folks. Uh, but he is um, wowzer. What a guy. Those, I mean, this painting is admittedly a painting, not a photograph, but they, they, have, they have done a number on those cheap... That, that jawline is um, something else. Yeah. Uh, I don't yeah. know if, there ever, if Mark ever lived... I don't think he lived long enough for there ever to be any photographs of him, so... Uh, That's a shame. I guess he had... But this is, this <laughs> is had... a pretty good representation, or at least uh, it's oh. a representation one can be reasonably pleased about. Good grief. Mm. Yeah. Uh, there's also a story after he makes it into the US that he produced uh, designs for the US Capitol building. Ooh. There was a competition uh, to uh, enter designs. It is disputed. Supposedly, he may not have actually turned up in America early enough for actually to be involved <laughs> with that competition. Once uh, again, and as the, uh, it very much becomes even more true with the next person we bring up, but writing their own hagiography here. <laughs> yes. Uh, pretty much everything about his story is taken from his his own yeah. uh, family and, and his own and his own writings. So he is very much telling his own story. Yeah. Um, but if uh, I have to say, um, uh, Paul Clement's book uh, of the biography Mark, biography of Mark Brunel is a really good read. Mm. Um, uh, just just the first few chapters on on Mark's story of uh, and wild adventures is. A, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. um, well, anyway, whilst he's in uh, the USA, he's he's mainly based in New York. He does become the uh, chief engineer of New York, whatever that title Ooh. means. Um, and 
he certainly has good connections. He becomes friends with Alexander Hamilton. Uh-oh. Uh, Wait a minute. Shall I, shall I do this? Then click onto the next slide. Here he is. Yes. I should, the, have, uh, I should have put a sound effect. Uh, I should have put a blinking Hamilton sound effect in, shouldn't I? But, uh, um, I'm glad I didn't. Maybe. Yeah, uh, the, the, the guy of the musical fame. Yeah, the guy off of the musical. Yeah, yeah, it's more famous for the musical than he is for actually being a US founding father these days, I think. If you want an yeah. insight into uh, why the Hamilton musical is such a hopeless hagiography, then strong recommend going and listening to or watching um, Do Not Eat's Franklin episode about money, where uh, Alexander Hamilton gets talked about quite a lot. Mm. Anyway, sorry, um, another digression. Yeah. Go on, Chris. So, uh, we're now up to about oh, at, right at the end of the 18th century, we're almost approaching 1800, um, and this is this is a period known as the Quasi War, which is a really odd bit of history where the French were sort of at war with America, but not <laughs> um, not a formally declared war. But the French are going around har- harassing um, a lot of U.S. Um, U.S. shipping. Mm. Um, uh, I, I can't remember the details exactly of how we've managed to get from the point where France was one of the first countries in the world to have um, U.S. diplomatic missions to uh, after after the Declaration of Independence to them being at war. Being at war with, with <laughs> um, history gets weird at this. Point. It does. It's, it does. History is very weird at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, and Hamilton introduces. Mark to another French emigre whose name escapes me at the moment, I'm afraid. But um, he um, come this this emigre has recently spent time in England and learnt that the British Navy are having a lot of time building all of their ships um, because they are trying to build a lot given that whole war with France thing. Yeah, and this is very much one of those enemy of my enemy is my friend moments. <laughs> <laughs> where uh, Hamilton tries to persuade Mark to go to Britain with a design that Mark has very hastily produced to uh, construct ship's blocks, which are essentially the pulleys that they have to produce. I think it's around 100,000 of a year um, uh, for all of the... You need a lot of pulleys on a sailing ship. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, So that... Um, he gives Mark a letter of introduction to Lord Spencer, who's, I think, the head of the British Navy at the time, uh, and packs Mark off to Britain. Um, and uh, I think it, within about a few weeks of arriving in Britain, Mark has already met up again with Sophie, who has somehow managed to escape beheading and made her own way back to Britain. <laughs> um, within, I think, within six very shortly after they're engaged. I mean, that uh, we, we want to hear Sophie's... I mean, we all are now going to go and Google Sophie's story because I, I fear it hasn't been told well enough, but it'd be interesting to read what the heck Sophie was doing to get out of that convent and get over it. Anyway, yeah. it's, it's quite the ripping yarn going on here. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Mark does a good job of uh, building the ship's blocks and that becomes sort of the, the basis of his wealth in Britain um, and where he gets all of his connections uh, and a few I think a short while afterwards um, Isambard arrives on the scene this guy yes here he is people are familiar with him and interestingly enough in front of ships chains because he also had an obsession with shipping yes um, and they he was Isambard was very close to his father um, they uh, worked on the um, Thames Tunnel together. I constantly get it confused with the Rather High Tunnel, but they are different, even though they're more or less the same place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Thames Tunnel being built as a as a pedestrian tunnel that then eventually ends up as um, part of what is now the East London Line. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the overground. Um, uh, and I think it's a re- that is a really long project in which I think Isambard is almost drowned. Yeah, he nearly <laughs> drowned. They drowned quite a lot of workers. People drowned several times. There was tunnels were a pig. Mm. Kind of the first modern tunnel that went under a navigable river. 
or something like that. There, there, there have been mm. tunnels before, but it was it was certainly a, a very distinctive structure, an important structure when it was built. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's the, the whole reason I'm telling this story is is this the connection between Mark learning descriptive geometry, learning all of these uh, drawing skills, being very well renowned for the quality of his drawings, and then the close relationship with his son. And whilst we don't know the details, we can speculate, I think, reasonably well that Isambard would have been taught a lot of these skills himself from his father, uh, given the close relationship and engineering relationship between them. And uh, Isambard becomes very good friends with Robert Stevenson. So we have all of these tenuous connections between going on between Monge and uh and, and Britain through through the Brunels, but 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 so uh, descriptive geometry in the UK has doesn't have a very good time, at least in terms of what the academic research that we talk about now. It's um, it doesn't really seem to be taught in any way, at least in the way that it is in France. In France, it's be, um, one of Monge's big pieces of work is the foundation of a lot of engineering schools that are, and one of the principal parts of the, the curriculum is teaching this descriptive geometry, and descriptive geometry becomes the way that engineers learn in, uh, um, in France, and that tends to spread in various different forms to most of Europe. But because you have this military secret aspect uh, followed by the war and very little contact between Britain and France, there isn't really, uh, the descriptive geometry doesn't become the predominant way that engineers are taught. And it's worth sort of trying to tease out the differences between how engineers are being taught in Britain and how they're being taught in France. Yeah, yeah. So in France, engineers are generally going into the polytechnics um, to, le uh, to learn the skills. So they're being taught the, and descriptive geometry is the, uh, is a method of giving mathematical underpinning to how every, all the geometry works. Whereas British engineers, drafters are being taught predominantly in apprenticeships. They might be going to evening classes Mm. Um, but they're, they're learning from their peers so it's actually very difficult to judge what uh, British engineers are being taught uh, because we don't have anywhere near as much uh, material to go on there are a few books that are being published as sort of manuals and guides but it's uh, because it's much harder to see how how much influence they're having and so certainly from the academic study of this subject now, there is uh, certainly the belief that descriptive geometry more or less has very little impact. It sort of goes through this brief period where in British universities, the academics in the 1840s and 50s get very excited about it. So they've discovered something new from the continent that they that will have some kind of revolutionary effect. And then they very quickly realise that it's probably not that different from what's already going yeah. on <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um so yeah um but there are also all of these sort of tenuous links that are going on between france france and britain there's the um uh the the brunels um also something um that is is interesting is that in ireland um, engineers and um, the Great Northern Railway of Ireland are being um, taught Mongean geometry in the 1850s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Siobhan Os Os Osgood um, at Irish Rail Arch um, on Twitter mm -hmm. um, has done some research into that, which is really interesting. Um, so go look that up. At Irish Rail Arch, <coughs> yep. Good yeah. Good I think I've follow, followed them already. Mm -hmm. And it's so my feeling at the moment pulling together all of these different stories is that there's part of a part of the story here that hasn't really been 
taught or, or, or learnt yet about what was going on in terms of how engineers were actually learning. Um, and I think it's a, something out there that people can, if someone really wants to get their, their nose stuck into it, I think there's some really interesting stuff we could do looking at how the engineering drawings from the first half of the 19th century actually evolved in their form, mm. how they look, um, and what that might tell us about the skills that the drafts, drafters were using to produce them. Um, and it, yeah, there's yeah. an interesting relationship then between what what was being drafted, refer, then re- reflecting back on what was being built and what was being constructed, and and, and a bit of a feedback loop there, because certainly it's the case that drafting can can impact on what is being built, you know, and and, and vice versa, and changes the way that that that, that process evolves. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So tell so so that's kind of traditional draft again, kind of that was sort of paper drafting. But what what else <laughs> what what else was going on? So. There's lots of other developments going on in the 19th century. Uh, when we move on to the 1860s and 70s, that's where we get our invention of blueprinting coming comes along. Aha, got a, here we go. A couple of nice uh, blueprints, this one and the next one. Um, this one, by the way, is a particularly horrible drawing, I would say. Um, this was a carry, uh, bogey native coaches sounds about as horrible as it, as yeah. it is this is um, a carriage for the central african railway which i think is modern day in modern day malawi mm. nyasa land which um, i think was became malawi um, just to give some context this this one carriage was designed to carry 164 passengers so some basic calculations um if you ignore all the benches and seating and, and just take the basic dimensions of the carriage at 164, that is roughly equivalent to the amount of space you get in a packed to the maximum uh, London tube train. Uh, the difference here being that people also would be carrying luggage uh, to a great degree and were also tra- um, travelling about an eight-hour journey in heat of 35 degrees plus it's just this is this is this is the railways doing a colonialism and doing absolute horrific racism at scale at an industrial scale uh, mm-hmm. because these will be in the segregated coaches right so there'll yeah. be nice like you know 50 50 seats in the in the white coaches and then these native the hot it's such an, it's such an awful euphemism the native coaches uh, mm-hmm. here carrying 164 passengers absolutely horrific um so yeah it's, it's a useful reminder of engineering for bad uh yes. here. Uh, uh, the, the, the clue is is the toilets that one single carriage would have four toilets um which were of course just holes in the in the floor as well yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was uh uh yeah Not very good. unpleasant but but the reason that I, I put this in aside aside from just bringing up that story that I think is important to be told is that uh, this is an example of a blueprint which is what actually went to the works so as I was mentioning before you had the um, uh, you'd have the original draft drafters work producing um, uh, a what would probably be a very beautiful uh, color drawing mm. that was then traced uh, onto a medium it's most commonly wax linen rather than tracing paper um, some so it was it came down to the company's preference uh, tracing paper does not store well and so given that it would be used as sort of the master copy to go back to and produce lots more copies from tracing paper was not the best choice so wax linen was used more predominantly um, tracing paper I'm looking at you the Great Western Railway at Swindon terrible stuff <laughs> <laughs> they loved it and it's yeah not 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 a fan um having to work with that material now um and then those uh were used uh and the important thing about tracing paper and, and the wax linen is that they're translucent so the process of actually producing a blueprint was you would lay the wax linen or tracing paper drawing on top of another piece of paper and that paper would be treated with ammonium ferric citrate 
I'm having to read that back from my notes because that's not an easy <laughs> one to remember. Ammonium um, ferric citrate, everyone. Yeah. Uh, which is a photosensitive chemical. When you expose that chemical to light, it turns blue. Mm. So the whole point was that you exposed, usually it's quite often done just using sunlight outdoors oh, okay. or indoors in large rooms with, with big windows uh, where you just lay one drawing on top of the other and the light would turn the ammonium ferric citrate blue where it was in contact but where the lines uh, inked in lines on the drawing prevented the light from carrying through um, the paper remained white you then had to wash off the, the ammonium uh, otherwise it would just all turn blue the next time you exposed oh, yeah. this light <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and once it was washed off you had a useful if not particularly um, attractive drawing like this one yeah, I mean there is a certain there is a certain elegance to the blueprint, but yeah, it's not quite as clear. And uh, perhaps we look at the next one as well, which is even clear. Although you've gone for another, this one's perhaps grim in a I'd say substantially less sinister way, uh, because this is a necropolis train. Yes. Um, is it now? Where, where do you know which necropolis train is? This the Waterloo bound necropolis. This train? is this is the Waterloo one. Yes. Oh, so yeah, fantastic! From, yeah. From Waterloo to Brookwood. This um, is a hearse carriage uh, from the necropolis train. Uh, scale one inch to one foot, and it's um, it's quite a nice big clear uh, image, and you can see where you'd uh, slide the coffins. <laughs> mm, yes. <laughs> so it's quite good. Um, this this would have been for the third class comic coffins, I think, because they there was first, second, and third class. Mm. Um, it was re the prices again, reg like most fares, regulated by uh, Parliament, but in this case, for the reason that. Uh, there needed to be a cheap third class fare because it was the parish, the London parishes that would pay for the uh, what were technically for, termed paupers yeah. to um, uh, to be taken away for burial. And the whole reason the entire railway existed was that London was running out of burial space because it was expanding far too quickly uh, for the amount of set for the number of cemeteries it had. And there was a crisis in the 1860s during one of the cholera epidemics where the bodies were just piling high because there wasn't any cemetery space left to, to bury them. Yeah, not, not a particularly pleasing period in um, London's history. But then, yeah, it wasn't the first and the last horrifying public health crisis. <laughs> no, it was mm. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a lovely one. So that's the hearse carriage. But this next, I think it's... it's I'm pleased, having, having had the discussion about draftsmen versus drafters... Um, Tell us about this image. So, um, uh, one of the elements of, of producing the drawings was the tracing. Um, so the draftsman would produce the original, and then that would be traced onto the wax linen or the or the, or the tracing paper. That job of the tracing was considered a lower skilled job because it was just copying, um, which, as you can imagine, with early twentieth century. Uh, opinions that was given to be the job of mostly women, uh, especially from the uh, First World War onwards. And it's sort of the kind of mentality that, that women were given jobs as secretaries or typists. It was considered lower skilled. So it does come from this rather misogynistic uh, yeah, yeah. world view of the time. But also it's, I think it's really important to acknowledge it because most of the material that now sits in, in the Rowery Museum and probably at Network Rail as well was produced by women. Mm. That, that it, it's, it's their hand that's actually produced all the material that survives because the colour drawings that I do like to show off are a very small subset of what actually survives because yeah. it was the master copies that could be used over and over again to produce new blueprints that were... Uh, the predominant drawings uh, it was those master copies that got kept the original draftsman's work was quite often thrown away the blueprints would be thrown away after they were used it was the master copies that were kept um, a lot of the stories that you do get of drawings being hoofed into skips or burned I, I've, I've come to learn that actually some of those some of the times it's just all the copies that were being got rid of 
yeah. and actually the master copies were kept. Not to say that there isn't a terrible attrition rate on on a lot of the drawings that were should have been kept but weren't. But not every. I, you do have to take stories of stuff being destroyed with a pinch of salt sometimes. Ah, okay, that's well, that's reassuring to know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to just point out, Ryan Hogg, rather, has pointed out what appears to be a structural mug uh, <laughs> on this uh, on this table, which is a nice spot. That does appear to be a structural mug placed there to keep... <laughs> to keep the <laughs> I had never angle. spotted that. Well, well done. Uh, good, good shout, Ryan. That is an excellent spot. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. But um, it's a lovely... I mean, this is actually a lovely office that... You can tell they've been told that photos have been taken because they all look quite pleased. Mm. They're all looking quite pleased. Um, it looks like quite a nice working environment, actually. They've got, they've got their coats hung up. It's all very smart. Um, what year is this photo taken? If, if, do you know what year this oh, photo taken? Which from? one? I've, um, da, 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 I can't remember off the top of my head. It was, it's either for, I think this one is Second World War. If I remember correctly, it's, this is the Second World War Doncaster. But ah, I, okay, yeah, yeah. It, um, I mean... It, that would the hair looks of that era. Um, yeah, uh, I've got a few different images from drawing offices, and they tend to just meld into one after you've looked at them a <laughs> hundred yeah. times. Uh, so which one's which? But yeah, but that's yeah, that's that is wonderful. And and yet yeah, it's worth everyone just to repeat that point. It's worth bearing in mind. Yeah, all of these arch, arch, archive drawings were created by the hand of women, um, and that's, that's it's it's quite an impressive legacy. I mean, for all sorts of reasons, like. Um, yeah, the misogyny involved in why that was the case, but also the kind of the, the, the you know the fact that it's incredible. There's this huge legacy of drawings, that, you know, thousands and thousands of drawings that you know in the network grade archive. Well, millions. You said you said millions. Mm. You know, it's a huge these huge archives of uh, of drawings that we still refer to. You know, the network rail drawings particularly, we still refer to these today, doing doing the work that we do on bridges and and stations and so on. Um, to, oh, talking of which, oh, it's a me bit. It's a bit you've yes. given to me, which is which is dangerous. So you asked me to sort of talk about the 20th century and drawings and kind of what's going on. I'm going to get rid of our little faces. So I thought I would put in um, kind of the kind of what was happening, what, 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 how little has changed, I suppose. So um, I thought I'd do like beginning, middle to, to second half-ish and then late uh, to early 21st century uh, comparison. So here's a here's sort of drawing... Uh, of a bridge um uh over the uh yeah, basically it's a bridge on the on what is now the Wednesday railway and uh, it's on the horse branch uh, and this drawing is by the northeastern railway which ages that bridge number 25 17 miles 46.57 chains there it is very nice um and you can see there's quite there's some nice sketching there's nice brickwork sketching and all sorts going on um also they're kind of quite nicely representing what appears to be the the skew of the bridge here on this drawing as well which is quite interesting uh, as well as the sort of structural support work, um, and it's not that different to the sort of drawings that you get. So this that that, that was a, that, this is a drawing from 1975 that I've just pinged up, and uh, it's nice. The BR drawings, the British Rail drawings, uh, generally all marked up with the British Railways Board, uh, and then the the address of the chief civil engineer um, for British Rail Eastern, which is in Hudson, the former Hudson House um, in York, and. Again, you can see this is just some detailing for uh, like a completely innocuous uh, pedestrian footbridge, actually. But it's quite, again, it's quite nice detailing. Uh, you can see it's all, everyone started writing in capital letters for some reason. Uh, it's again, pretty familiar to, to anyone who's seen modern drafting work. But yeah, it's quite nice. There's some sort of 3D stuff. There's 2D project, kind of uh, sort of standard third angle projection. And then if I chuck this drawing up, which is, again, uh, actually, this is on SPD one, so this isn't on the. Those two previous drawings are on the horse branch. This is not, but it's a similar thing. This is this is much more modern. This is uh, done by Chorus Rail Consultancy, which uh, got gobbled up into TSP, and I don't I don't know who has it now. I can't remember. I think it, they've been gobbled up into another consultancy. It doesn't really matter. But again, you can see uh, this is a drawing that is using early CAD. So the previous two were hand drawn, right? Both hand drawn. This is early computer aided design, and it's. It's it's pretty shonky, and actually, some of the early CAD drawings, some of the early computer aided design drawings, are worse than the hand hand done drawings that they're replacing, um, which is quite interesting. But even that now is mostly. I mean, we still create. You know, as you saw my one earlier, my, my my drawing that I did earlier, um, showing the track alignment through a particular station. 
But uh, nowadays, most of the drafting we're doing is this sort of thing. Is actually, you know, drafting is done in 3D and then we represent that 3D in 2D for the benefit of explaining the design to other people. But actually, for the purposes of uh, of the actual design process, it's the 3D, uh, kind of the 3D model. So draft the skill of a drafter has changed now from being representing things in 2D to very much representing things in 3D. Um, mm. This is, uh, for those curious, this is actually the link... I don't think it's what the design looks like anymore, but this is the link at Hanzik between HS2 and the West Coast Mainline. Uh, so there are spoilers. Um, yeah, Chris, worth, any worth, thoughts on this while it's spinning mm, around yeah. in a loop? Well, well, worth remembering that as much as it, it, the design work is being done in 3D, you're always still viewing it in a 2D medium on Absolutely, a screen. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so it's not, not always, but pretty much always. Yes, it is. Ba- this is basically just a... a a moving 2d drawing we do some vr stuff with actual purpose nowadays mm. um i'm i want this to get a 3d printer so we can 3d print our cab models uh because I'd, I'd be well up for that um the the models the, some of the things i get most excited about in the railway museum are those two um models of the channel tunnel rail link uh particularly the tiny little tiny scale one and i would love to just create those from our from our track designs it'd be great to have a little 3d anyway I've gone off on one. <laughs> but here you go. So here's uh, here's just some CAD going around in the loop. Anyway, so that, that was my brief, like, how, how CAD, certainly how infrastructure CAD has changed. But it's basically the same for mechanical stuff, you know, hand-drawn until pretty recently, and then CAD took over really. You kind of, ta- CAD took over in a big way in the, uh, in the kind of the 90s, really. It was as late as the 90s, a bit in the 80s, but really it was through the 90s. Yeah, and, and CAD itself goes back to... Well, 1950s, I think it was. Yeah. So, so it, t- it took first... a long time to to get from uh, first first gestation to um, uh, being as dominant as it is now. Absolutely, yeah. So the you know the the design tools were happening as in CAD as in the design side rather than the drafting side was was happening. So the first major project on the railways that used it was the Selby diversion. It was based off of it was. MOS, it was called, was the, the, the technology which used survey inputs, actual survey inputs, and then created a design. Um, and that was that was created by North Yorkshire and Durham County Councils. Uh, and MOS evolved into the technology that I use today to design railway alignments still. So uh, there's a, a strange legacy there as well. Anyway, we digress because I can see a load of objects that are quite familiar to me as being in the current railway museum, but this is not the current railway museum. So what, what, what are we looking at now? No, this is um, Clapham Transport Museum. Uh, and I think it's useful to talk about why we have so many drawings left that have been saved yeah. for what is essentially obsolete yeah. material that, that could, in many other industries, would have been thrown away a very long time ago. Um, but the uh, nationalisation... Um, one of the sort of minor things that had to be dealt with in that legislation was that the four group pre um the four grouping companies mm. lner uh, lms southern uh, great western all had their own little museums <laughs> full of stuff yeah uh the northeastern railway museum in york for example um there were odd little ones uh, elsewhere around the country there was um there is a permanent way museum in crew that i didn't uh, the Wait, lms what? permanent way museum permanent way museum in crew yes which i i didn't even know about until a couple of weeks ago um i presume it's not there anymore i don't believe it is uh i think it is another one that got subsumed um but yeah i uh, if anyone out there remembers it i'd be curious to know more about it um uh but so the legislation had to deal with what to do with all of this old stuff hanging around in all these museums. So the BR had to, uh, British Railways had to appoint a curator to oversee all the material. Hmm. Um, and that, I think, um, I don't know if it, if he was appointed from the beginning, but uh, John Scholes um, was the certainly at the, later on the, uh, the curator in that position who... Um, uh, oversaw the Clapham Transport Museum, which included, um, uh, as you can see there, Mallard. I think, is that Wren or Pet in the front? It is Wren, yeah. It's, it's Wren, Wren, which for a long yeah. while was in the front entrance. In fact, is it still in the front entrance? It's still, it's still in the entrance of the museum, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. So. And the dynamometer um, car, by the look of it as well, still attached. Yes. As it is now. 
Yes. Mm. That is a wonderful object to get inside, by the way. Oh, um, really? Oh, yeah. I shall be prodding Bob or Ant to let me into that at some point. Mm. That's, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I had the... Press. Yes. Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's too, as soon as we talk, talk, start talking about the museum it's just mm. it, it, I did an entire episode which was one long digression of me running around the North Shed uh, so yeah I enjoyed it, it's that dangerous one, yeah. um, so we um, uh, so that, that one of the other benefits of, of that position was that all of the drawings that were rapidly becoming obsolete as the steam era came to an end instead of being binned uh, started making their way to Clapham, mm. uh, and then from 1975, when the NRM came along uh, to replace the Clapham Transport Museum, they started coming to us. And it took a very long time to start cataloguing all of those drawings. I, I have to say, the museum probably focused a bit more on its big engines than it did on its archives until the start of this millennium. Uh, but around two. Uh, around 2000 and onwards um, a big cataloging effort started mm. and most of the drawings from uh, pretty much all of the drawings from the main works carriage and wagon and loco are now catalogued um, the uh, there's plenty more to do um, but the big certainly the uh, in terms of the percentage of cataloging that we've done the drawing collections are actually really up there in terms of the the amount, the, the percentage that we've achieved. The archives are huge and unending and we keep we will always keep acquiring more material to tell the story yes. of the railways. So it is always going to be a, a never ending project. Um, but we're catching up, which is the important thing. Absolutely. I mean, it's million, as you say, millions. It's just an enormous archiving effort. Uh, yeah. yeah. And the, draw the drawings aren't even the largest collections. The, the photographic collections are around yeah. 2 million. <laughs> so it's, How many? Uh, around 2 million. <sighs> if you think about it, a photographic negative takes up a lot less space than a drawing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's true. <laughs> Good grief. Yeah. Crikey. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so having so so museum so so they ended up this is how the nrm got it well actually it's having just watched the uh, strongly recommend by the way for those who are patron subscribers to well problem podcast who i mentioned already t tonight um uh, they've just done the bonus episode on museums which is well worth a listen to actually um in terms of curatorial stuff and, and context for some of these drawings we put up the, the drawing earlier of the of the uh, you know the, the native carriage the horrifically named native carriage you know this this carriage basically to to reinforce horrific racial subjugation um to what extent do you think there's do you think there's a gap do you think there's enough done in terms of um explaining the context of some of these drawings or or do you think with that sort of archive you can store it as is and 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 it's up to people in t who then pick out the object to then interpret it and and and, and curate it themselves. What, what what do you think about that? So part of my part of the rationale when I first came up uh, su uh, submitted the idea for creating the book was to get a better understanding of a drawing collections and also to to make that advocacy within the museum that the drawings are a resource that can tell those kinds of stories mm. that. But I haven't actually explained it yet in terms of what the book, the, the ethos behind the book was, but the ethos was to tell, wasn't just to show off lots of pretty drawings and explain a little bit about them, but it was to actually tell the story of the railways using the drawings used to build them. So it's take, each, each drawing in the book is trying to tell either an engineering story or a social or political history um, story about what the railways did and how they changed the world that's why there, there are plenty of drawings of locomotives but what is why you'll find lots of odd and strange things like omnibuses and um artificial legs and, and all those yeah, kind of yeah. things in there as well and it's and, it, and it, i suppose it comes back to the fact that as with any objects within the museum particularly particularly a museum like the Royal museum which is, is so deeply rooted i mean it's more deeply rooted you know the, Put the British Museum to one side, and, and the fact that it's just a, a treasure hoarding, arguably. But in terms of you know the Railway Museum is is much more about social, so much more about social history and about the history across classes and across sort of various group, you know, different groups in society. 
And I suppose each of the objects, whether it's an whether it's a physical object, you know, a shiny locomotive or a drawing or a photograph, they act as anchors or pins that, that allow us to pin or kind of capture a bit of, of the story and pin it to the fact here's a real thing or a, a flat thing that pins it in place, pins the story in place. And, and it's incumbent on any of us who try and then interpret those ob- and, and people, who, you know, any, any of us interpreting those those objects to, to do our best to represent the, the, the sort of mm. the how they sit within history and, and, and the context. Yeah. And um, yeah. And particularly with these with these drawings, these you might think, oh, they're just technical drawings. There's no social context there. But we've just shown several objects, several of the drawings which have massive implications you know you, you go back to the marylebone one with with rates on it with tax rates on it it'd be interesting mm. to think about the the pressures that that then resulted in to to, to people in the local area and some of there, there's always a there's a there's a context and a, and a social impact of the things that these things are building you know um yeah it's it, it it's it is interesting and, and i think you're there there are several several entries within the book I'll not spoil it for people, but there are several of the things that you you detail where you talk about that social context, and it's really, yeah, it's it's really interesting. I really enjoy it. Anyway, we we dig, we'll talk a little bit more about the book momentarily, but let's go back to our miniaturized faces. So that's the Clap Museum. Here's Tornado. Tell us well, yeah. why are you why have you got a picture of Tornado here? So uh, I wanted to finish off talking about how the drawings are used today. Uh, we spent quite a bit talking about how the drawings are never rarely used mm. but uh it'd be interesting to say what people are using the drawings for in, in the Rowan Museum because they are the most popular subject for researchers uh both in terms of those that visit to look at drawings in in the museum but uh, or any material in the museum but drawings the most popular and also in terms of what I do with my day job into uh, providing copies of material from the collection the drawings are uh by far the most popular material that I provide copies of. Um, uh, so uh, the fir- this is sort of the first uh, example. We get a lot of requests from Heritage Railways maintaining current rolling stock uh, uh, and other mute- museums as well. So we- we're important in terms of supporting the work that they do, it- having a drawing available to work from when uh, repairing uh, or doing overhauls, yep. replacing components. It's really important uh, for saving money, I think, and making it viable uh, yep. without having to, to in, uh, back engineer it to work out what was going on if you don't have a drawing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and related to that is uh, the new builds that have uh, are gradually appearing, um, including Tornado here, which had uh, the A1 Trust had a vast number of drawings from us. They also had, um, uh, uh, for the P2 project that they're currently working on, we had, uh, they had, I think it was about 480 drawings that they digitized um, from our collection, really? just to be able to produce that one locomotive. Bear in mind that they're going to, after take take a look at all of those drawings, they're then um, making amendments to them to sort of bring the design up to more modern standards as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, on the next one, we've got oh, another yeah. good example. Great, shout out to Graham Bunker, who's probably the man standing inside the, on the footplate of Tornado there. Um, now, what? Now this is a very fetching, if uh, interesting, historically uh, train. It's a hush-hush. Mm. Uh, but this is a you'll see that the dimensions are funny because this isn't a real sized one this is uh uh smaller <laughs> yes this is, this is a, an hour gauge model from hornby uh i think it's it's coming out very soon um i hope yeah. they don't mind me stealing the, an image from that website to give them a bit of free publicity um for it. uh but this um this model has been based off a rather large number of drawings that have been uh taken from well, taken the cop- digitized from our collection mm. being used by their designers to produce something that is far more accurate than it otherwise could be uh, given that the only other resources available to produce a model like this are just photographs yeah uh, mm-hmm. given that it didn't even make it to the 1940s in this form it was yeah. <laughs> um, we built into something that looked vaguely like uh, a bit like an a4 but with a that extra wheel at the back, which apparently gave a rather comfortable extra large cab. 
Oh yeah, nice. <laughs> I, I imagine the drivers the drivers liked it. I guess the firemen wouldn't have liked it so much having to get the coal that much further to the, uh, yeah. the firebox. <laughs> yes. Yeah, having to do a bit of a sprint between shovels. Yeah, quite. Yeah. But um, yeah, so so t- you know the, the, these archive drawings are being made use of, particularly with the locomotives here. A couple of examples. Mm-hmm. This, these are, so these are the asks you're getting from maintaining old locos, building new ones, mm-hmm. are both little and large. Yeah, and we're not, and we're talking, uh, and it's not just people making physical models; it's people making virtual ones as well. Mm. Um, we've had requests from video game, uh, film, and TV uh, researchers as well to produce uh, to assist in in producing uh, um, digital representations of trains, trying to improve their accuracy mm. uh, in the representation as well. Oh, fascinating! Absolutely fascinating. So. Um, next image, yes, is taking so, us right back to the start of the, the modern railway era. Anyway, so I, I mentioned historians and, and professional academics are uh, doing research into the railways. Are another constituent that are u- making use of, of drawings from our collection. Um, uh, we have uh, one of our PhD researchers at, at the moment that's embedded in the museum, taking a look at uh, dining. Um, dining cars using the drawing collections and um, this one is uh has a rather fantastic story behind it this is this is drawing is in black and white but the original is not the reason it's in black and white is that this is an infrared scan of the drawing which we produced uh essentially trying to look at all these really hard to read pencil marks that you can see around because um using different forms of spectrographic imaging sometimes can help you pick out these faded um, faded pencil marks. Unfortunately, in this occasion, didn't do a great job of improving things. If, uh, <laughs> yeah. if, if Just about wants... make out the word spokes and, mm. uh, yeah, not much more. But are those scribbles scribble? In fact, I'm not going to shoot your fox here. Do you know whose scribbles those might be? Well, um so this is a drawing that was produced by John Llewellyn. Trying to get my Welsh pronunciation in there. Um, uh, who was a contemporary of Richard Dravithic. And this drawing is interesting in that, uh, although it's dated to December 1803, about three months before Penny Darren became the world's first working railway steam locomotive, um, we don't actually this this drawing is not penny darren we're very confident of that yeah um the it says it has a, a three feet stroke and if you compare the stroke um to the gauge on the other part of the drawing we can't see here um they are identical the penny darren was not three foot gauge um so this is this definitely isn't isn't penny darren there is a, a belief for quite a long time that this was the locomotive that may or may not have been built at colebrookdale um, ah, yeah. And if you and if you go to Bliss Hill Museum, you will find a conjectural reconstruction of a locomotive based on this specific one drawing. I think um, I've used the video. There's a clip of the of that Colbrookdale machine mm. on the move, because um, yeah, they're replica on the move actually. And uh, yeah. yeah, I have to be sorry to um, uh, to the guys at Bliss Hill, but this probably isn't that either. Um, <laughs> Uh, the this uh, there there were no connections between this drawing and Colebrookdale. John, uh, it was produ- We know who produced it, John Llewellyn, and he was uh, work- living and working in South Wales in the valleys, um, alongside um, I think it's Humphrey. Um, uh, some Humphrey. I'm someone. Correct me. I'm. I'm messing up his name, but. Um, who was involved in, in the bet to uh, on Penny Darren as to whether it would work or not in 1804. Uh, so this has all the connections to South Wales, but it isn't Penny Darren. And yeah. this is possibly a locomotive that may have actually been built. There are a few candidates. So is this that- potential that this was before... This was actually a locomotive that was built and running before Penadaran was. Yeah. Correct. Well, there you go. And, 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 and I always find it one of the most fascinating things about railway history in that 
in the early history, there's so much we do not know and probably never will know that even to the extent that we can't be 100% certain what the world's first steam locomotive was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I like that ambiguity. It pleases me. Uh, as I said, the railways started in this country in the uh, very early 1600s. So, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I- I'm, a, I'm an early railway truther, if you like. I'm uh, <laughs> always trying to whip the rug out from underneath stops in Darlington. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean... So that, that, I mean, that is, is, and then there's one, ah, right, okay. Uh, yes. Okay, okay. Right. So, so I'm going to hide we've... our faces again. Yeah. Y- you have a challenge. Uh, yes. So uh, this, this drawing is a big clue, but um, uh, to anyone that can work it out. But um, if someone in the, if people in the chat would like to take a guess at what the current oldest working item of rolling stock, and by uh, very specifically rolling stock, so locomotive, carriage, or wagon, on the current network is and this drawing is a bit of a clue as to what it might be it is and we're going to talk amongst ourselves uh whilst we wait for the 10 or 15 seconds while people sort of scribble away uh, slash google it and type it in but hopefully some people will work out what the answer is funnily enough so you yeah it's interesting you, you asked me this question in an email and i responded with mm. a load of wrong answers uh, <laughs> because for some reason my brain went straight to passenger rolling stuff mm. when actually hint hint because people are typing as we speak actually um it's not necessarily passenger rolling stock. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I think if I was just doing passenger rolling stock, my answer would be would 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 not be wrong. We have a couple of people. Um, actually, Ryan has come in with a suggestion. Everyone else is still. Oh, so we've got some people suggesting. Actually, that's a very interesting point. So that, that I hadn't thought about that in terms of locomotives. Probably some of the class eights are very very old, mm-hmm. but I don't think they're this old. No, they they definitely won't be this old. And, um, so, and the reason I put this drawing in is that this is a drawing that's been requested by the mod- someone from within the modern industry. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> this is from uh, 1924, then, this drawing. Yes. Uh, uh, and is actually signed by um, the big Sir Nigel Gresley himself. I was, was going to say, Nige has actually signed. As Nigel Gresley's signed it on the 26th of March, 1924. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, he, yeah. Um, uh, and we do get other requests from the modern industry. We've had requests for those drawings of those OH shunters as well. Oh, yeah. um, and, and of it, it's not a common occurrence because generally, where drawings were still needed, they were retained and they're mm. at the RDDS or or maybe just nowhere at all. But yeah. um, <laughs> uh, but there there are still occasions where drawings that have made it into our collection are. Uh, are still needed and they are requested so for those lots of people who are there are a few wrong suggestions but there are also pleasingly several correct suggestions from ryan uh hog roaming adocrat uh who else is down here who else has suggested yes yeah, so for those who don't know yes this is a 10 this is a, a an lner tender which was then adapted into a snowplow and mm-hmm. so the snowplows that you see parked up in fact they're often parked up at doncaster you might be passing them um, there are a few around around the country. The sort of the, the medium sized ones, right? Not the big ones, but the medium sized ones. Is that right? It's the medium sized ones that are the that, that, yes, that rely on so. these tenders. Um, yeah, we did a snowplow nerd episode with Alex. Alex Alex Priestley should should actually he's not enough of a rail nerd to know this, although he he, he is much more <laughs> of a rail nerd than he would ever admit himself. Yes, yeah, so this is the, this is the suspension, the spring the the leaf spring suspension of one of those tenders. It's very interesting to see that. Um, I was suggesting that it was the HST because the the uh, the carriages, Mark III carriages, are the oldest, are amongst the oldest. They're now fifty years old, so they're not far off. Mm. But actually, these are substantially wow. older than that. You know, running right back to yeah. nineteen twenty-four. Good grief! We're not we're not far off being uh, twice as old, are we? We're, um, yeah, right. we're we're almost at a century. Yeah, good. Great. Yeah, nearly a cent, a hundred year old. I mean, hopefully they make the ton. Uh, then we should do a little celebration of them. In fact, that should be a real natural episode, just dedicated to the hundred year old rolling stock that's still in operation. Nice one. Oh, Chris, that has been... Uh, I'm going to get our large faces up. Chris, that's been brilliant. I've enjoyed that very much. Um, it only remains for you to do a last description of the book because you, you talked a bit about where the book came out, but if I put the, if I put the little, our little faces back and then we have the book in the background, um, mm. is there anything else you want to say about the book before I, before I then vigorously plug it hard for you? Yeah, so... Um, yeah, that, that ethos behind it is that... It, I, d- I deliberately didn't want it to be a hard 
engineering, purely engineering book. It is trying to pull together all of those different threads of what the railways have done, what they, what, how they've changed the world. And I do mean the world. It's not, it's not just Britain. Mm. Um, and we do have drawings from uh, Japan, Germany, Australia. Um, yeah, uh, quite a few, few countries in there. There's subjects on war, um, uh, the staff as well, talking about the lives of the staff and, and how job roles have changed and picking out drawings related to that. Um, and, uh, and the experience of passengers and how freight transport as well has um, been so important part of what the railways do and, uh, and their impact on, on, on Britain and the world as well. Absolutely. It's, it's a fantastic book. And the, the moment some of you might have been waiting for, you can go and buy it. There is a link in the description. If you click on the link in the description, and then if you enter the code uh, railnata25, all one word, you get a, you get a, disc- you get a 25% discount. A 25% discount off the book. Isn't so that good? It's, it's a pretty good discount. I know, right? Uh, mm. Cheeky. I'm going to pop it. Just say one thing. Um, it is only valid in the UK. Um, the book is on sale internationally, um, so you can get if you if you Google the name of the publisher Thames and Hudson and your country, you will find the website their website in places like USA, Australia, uh, and a few other different places, and you can order it from there as well. Unfortunately, this link this this discount code isn't going to work for that. So you can so. Um... But you'll save yourself a hell of a lot of shipping. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, this is true. It is mm. true. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's a good point, and the customs charges and so on and so forth. Chris, that's mm-hmm. been so fantastic. That's been so brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we'll, let, we'll we'll come back to Chris. If you've got any questions for Chris, send them in now. I'll do I'll do my outro bits, but uh, send your questions in for Chris, uh, and then we'll we'll close the episode and then come back to Chris uh, shortly. So as usual. Um, this is available. Well, it isn't at the moment because the podcast is still broken. So um, it's not available in audio only form at the moment because we're having some domain issues. So it will be fixed soon. Sorry, everyone. And to the people who are listening to this probably in like a month. Uh, yeah, sorry that Rail Nat had disappeared for a bit. Hopefully it will come back and work properly uh, and we won't lose all the stats. Who knows? Um, the usual uh, sort of plugs, uh, patreon.com slash Gareth Dennis to support me on, on, on Patreon. Please do that. Uh, it, it allows these things to happen. Um, Gareth Dennis at UK slash Discord. The, there is a, a reshaping of of the Rail Natter Discord report the, the, overdue for publication. The, uh, the integrated Discord plan uh, is late uh, because, yes, I'm going to tidy it up a bit because it's got a bit nebulous. So stay tuned for that. And then if you just want to throw a loose change at me, paypal.me slash Gareth Dennis, uh, that is also very helpful and appreciated, particularly when you leave a nice comment, which a couple of people have done recently, which is very nice of you. Thanks. Um, I do this outside of a nine to five. So that's why it's pretty shonky. But every little bit of support that you give uh, allows me to justify taking like, you know, many evenings off to prep things. What else? Ah, right. Yes. Chris, there is a. We are going to come back to you before the end because uh, you want to do a little plug. Yes. Not just for the Rail um, Museum, but for a specific part of the a specific function of the Rail Museum. Yes. So, search engine library and archives is free to visit. Um, go and take a look at the Railway Museum website, and if you want to come and do some research, look at some lovely drawings, or just actually, you can now just uh, we we've recently re- opened up the doors, so you can just wander in and come and ask us questions. Uh, currently open uh, Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays. Uh, so you can come in and eventually we will get those Wednesdays open again as, as we did before um, uh, in a few months time, hopefully. Oh, I and story, yeah, yeah uh, so come in, ask us questions, uh, email us through the website or um, uh, c- come and take a look at things. Um, it's a fantastic resource. Uh, there is nowhere in the country that you can find out, uh, answer so many questions about railways uh, as you can in search engine. It is a um, brilliant resource. And, I, and I'm also going to ask for one more plug. Oh, do it. Um, so uh, I will be doing a book signing in the Rowing Museum, uh, only fixed today uh, on the f- Friday, the 15th of October, uh, between 11 and uh, 3 o'clock. So if you would like me to sign your book or come and ask me questions about anything you read in it, uh, do come and say hello. 
So that was 11 till 3 p.m. on Friday the 11th of October. Correct, yes. Ah, I shall send that in the chat. Ah, nice. You can go and get your book signed and ask Chris questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Um, there are other ads. Wait a minute. I've got uh, one more, a couple more plugs. Um, last warning for... Uh, if you want to, talking of books, uh, it's weird to put, the, Gary, the reason I put this in is because we had Gary on last week. In fact, as you know, Chris, because you, you joined us, and um, his, his Kickstarter is about to end. So last chance, to go and get your, if, if you're in the mood for buying books, which hopefully everyone, uh, uh, hopefully everyone is, um, oh, uh, we'll get to your question, Bill, good question. Uh, go, go to the Kickstarter to, to buy that book as well. Um, on the subject of uh, history, if you're interested in such things, also in the subject of people getting 3D, uh, getting d building 3D models for games off of archive drawings, uh, this Friday will be an episode, a particularly interesting episode of uh, An Engineer Plays. If you've no idea what I'm talking about, um, tune into that to find out. But um, things are going to start happening. Uh, what else? Uh, and oh yeah, next week, next week, next Rail Natter, a title TBC. Excitingly, it's all very last minute, but it's it's Rail Week, fourth to the tenth of October. It's Rail Week next week, and as a result of that, we've got George Chilka off of uh, well a, a few places actually. He works for HS2, doesn't he? But uh, he's also um, a very high up person in young rail professionals. So George is going to come and talk to us about. If you remember, we had a Rail Week uh, episode last year. Uh, this year. Uh, we've got George to talk about something. Ooh, TBC. Yes. Um, let's go back to our large faces. That is indeed next week's uh, next week's Real Natural episode. We've got a couple of questions that have come in, Chris. Okay. Uh, firstly, Bill Harvey has asked a cheeky question, which is uh, he's hoping that you aren't the one who takes the 25% hit. Uh, you can say... Uh, uh, no, I, I do not. <laughs> I do not personally take the 25% hit, no. Because I wouldn't have been advertising if it was. Um, mm. David Shepard has asked a really interesting question, which I like, which I think we'll end on, um, which is, please ask Chris what lost drawing he would most like to have. Um, okay, here's, here's an interesting answer to that. Um, a BR standard 9F, gender arrangement. Um, uh, not because it's lost, but because it never existed. Um, mm, so, good. so an interesting point that I don't get to discuss very often is that I put in all of these fantastic drawings into the book of locomotives and things like that, uh, showing the whole locomotive in lots of detail. But around the 1940s into the 1950s, those general arrangement drawings were really out of vogue. Uh, partly because, and this is this is the the the, the secret about all the drawings in the book. Uh, or of locomotives and things like that. The, the drawings you're looking at weren't really used for building the locomotives uh, or the car or the stock because they having a general arrangement drawing like that isn't really necessary. And if you look closely at the dates on them, you'll quite often notice that the dates are after the locomotives were built. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, the more important drawings were all of the components and the sub-assemblies. The general arrangement drawings were generally produced as a future record of what had been constructed. Ah. So those, those brilliant drawings that give you a whole overview of, of the locomotive, uh, they stopped producing them a bit during the Second World War and for the BR standards most of them although so, there are some general arrangements but most of them do not have one That's because so they weren't they weren't necessary they weren't really needed and it's it was by a the bit time of you a, built the kit of parts the people that you know <laughs> the, the very experienced locomotive builders just put them all together pretty much as they needed to be because for the most part the, the, but it's just the detail of each component those drawings were vital but that's so interesting so they ended up acting where they did exist acting as as builds mm. Yeah. More than and the, uh, yeah, and the reason the reason we know that there never was one is that one of the resources we have in the archives are the registers of what drawings were produced. Sometimes they're just a long list of every drawing that was produced in that in that drawing office, but sometimes they are ones for a each individual specific locomotive carriage or whichever. Mm. So you get a uh, you get an overview of exactly which drawings were produced, and sometimes there's the general arrangement line in the table, and there's it's just blank next to it. Amazing. Because I never needed it. That's a that's a fantastic and fascinating answer. 
Chris Falcone and everyone. That's what a what a show. I'm so glad. It, it, we ran long, but I'm so glad we did because we did promise that it was going to be the the very long history of of technical drawing. Chris, <laughs> that's been so so interesting. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, everyone, thanks also to everyone watching. You're you're over there. You're over there. Thank you. Uh, and 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 basically join join next week. But Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure, really, from both of us. It only remains for us to say cheerio, cheerio, everyone, cheerio. Goodbye.